Ladies and gentlemen, we focused just now on building connections through broader, deeper, focused collaboration. And in fact, connection has absolutely been a theme throughout this conference, hasn't it? And that's for very good reason, because linking up actors, organizations, sectors is so important for what Minister Enerot yesterday referred to as that integrated, indivisible approach that is characteristic of safe systems. We have not only been talking about connection here at the Third Global Ministerial, we've also absolutely been practicing it, forging personal ties that can help us scale up future action. Our closing session is entitled Moving Forward to 2030, but before we go forward, let us just briefly take a quick look back. We have a short film for you. We are in a defining moment for global road safety. Each year, 1.4 million people are killed in traffic. This means that 3,500 people lose their lives in traffic every day, all year around. Traffic injuries are the most common cause of death among young people globally. This is not acceptable. We have set upon ourselves to halve global road deaths and serious injuries by 2030. This is an immense challenge. We must inject a sense of urgency in our strive for road safety. This third global ministerial conference on road safety has had a vital task to chart the way forward to making achieve this goal. And the message from the plenary stage, the parallel sessions and the discussions in the corridor has been clear. We can do it. But to reach our goal, we need much greater political commitment. We need stronger allies and partners in government, in civil society, in the private sector and across the global development community. To do it, we must seize the opportunity offered by the Sustainable Development Goals. The strength of the SDGs is their interdependence. We need to show how action for road safety can help to achieve many of the global goals. By not accepting illegal speeding, we can reduce CO2 emissions in the transport system by up to 20%. When the private sector uses sustainable practices and reports safety performance, we can put safety on the market and we as a government can procure with safety as key element. By integrating a gender perspective in planning, we can create more sustainable and livable cities and also safe and sustainable transport system for all. Vision Zero can help to achieve so many other visions. And the Stockholm Declaration sets out practical actions for road safety within the wider SDGs. It reflects the input and engagement by many countries and organizations and some of the world's leading experts. So now, Let's all work together to translate these words in our declaration into real action on every highway and street, for every community and every child. And we are very grateful to the FIA Foundation for producing that great film for us. So now it is time to talk about how we move forward. And we have invited a group of committed road safety leaders to share their visions and their goals and their priorities. They represent the five main stakeholders whose efforts absolutely are central to achieving all the aims that we've been talking about here for the last two days, meaning civil society, youth, policymakers, international organizations, and industry. And I will now invite them to the stage one by one. They will come up and 
hold their remarks, and then uh, go back down. So I'd like to start out by asking Lotte Brandum, who is Executive Director of the Global Alliance of NGOs for Road Safety, to please come on stage. Lotte, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Your Excellencies, good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Lotte Brondum, and I'm the head of the Global Alliance of NGOs for Road Safety. We represent 235 non-governmental organizations in 92 countries, and a lot of them are here today. I'm going to take four minutes of your time, so please bear with me, because I know you're very tired and exhausted after two very intensive days here in Stockholm. But I'm going to tell you about leadership and how I would like you to act now and stand by the promises that you make. While we have been together here in Stockholm the past two days, another 4,000 people have lost their lives on the world's roads and around 300,000 people have been injured. We can make as many targets, and frameworks, and declarations as we like, and we can fly in hundreds of ministers and delegates, show films, and make speeches from nice podiums. But we need you, the ministers, the UN, and the private sector, to act now and stand by the promises you make, and show real leadership. I'll give you two good reasons as to why your actions and your leadership is so important. The first good reason as to why your leadership and actions are so important is that nothing, nothing will change unless you make it happen. Safety is not an option, it's a right. And I'm going to give you an example and this is from Zambia, but it could have been so many other countries. It's a note from a member, an alliance member, an NGO in Zambia, and I quote, I was the breadwinner of my family and responsible for my wife, four children and two dependents. I was involved in a road crash which robbed me not only of my physical ability but also of my psychological stature. I lost my source of income and my local NGO that was helping many other vulnerable people in my community, it collapsed. I lost all my savings and I had to sell my furniture to make ends meet. My family and my social ties were brought into serious question. Without access to health insurance, I have to depend on the usual poorly resourced public health system in my low-income country. Article 3 of the Human Rights Declaration states that everyone has the right to life, security, to safety. But most people do not live in countries who care about this basic human right you saw the frustrated mothers at the opening, and you heard the youth asking and saying, enough is enough. And we therefore, we need you, the ministers, and we need your action to protect individuals from injuries and from deaths. The second good reason as to why you need to act now is the great potential that is to be the leader of tomorrow, a leader who stand by your promises and care about basic human rights. We know you want to be that leader who protect your people, who are accountable to your pe people, to your citizens and to your communities. And there's some good news here, because the Alliance have launched a commitment tracking tool and it's a tracking tool that tracks specific commitments that are made to road safety. We're launching the tracking tool today, 
And if you check the tracking tool right now, you'll find that there's 45 commitments, specific commitments to road safety. This is commitments such as 30 kilometers an hour in a school zone. And 45 commitments, it's not mind-blowing numbers, but it is a start. And I would like to congratulate the 45 leaders who have committed and who are demonstrating how they care about the communities and the citizens where they live. But these 45 commitments, they now need to be millions. And we need your help. And the NGOs and the Global Alliance, we're here to partner with you. We're here to share the good news. We're here to applaud with you. And we're here to celebrate with you, implement with you as you act, keep your promise, and save lives. Now, you may say, well, all this is very complex and it's not straightforward and there's some um, very difficult things here. But to you, I say nothing will change unless you make it happen. And I sincerely hope that you travel back home and you show good leadership, you take the Stockholm Declaration with you, show good leadership and show how to implement traffic safety and victim support in your countries. So act now, because it's a basic human right. And keep your promise, because you are the modern leader of the future. I'd like to ask all the NGOs who are here in the room to stand up, please. Because I also want you to see that these are the people you need to reach out to. Because these are people who would like to discuss concrete solutions with you. And are happy to talk to you about how we reach our common goal of safer roads to all. Thank you. Thank you very much for that clear message. And we hear now from another speaker who has a clear call to action to share with us. She is project manager at the World Youth Assembly. You will remember that we heard about its work yesterday in the opening session. Please welcome Raquel Barrios. Your Excellencies, Honorable Delegates. Let me begin by thanking the Ministerial Conference host and all partners of the Second World Youth Assembly that, for making the youth present possible in this important event. I would like to start off with two quotes. First, in most of the world's poorest countries, death by traffic is a bigger killer than major diseases. Road injuries kill more children aged 5 to 14 in poor countries than malaria or AIDS. And they are the single biggest killer for 15 to 29 years old. Second quote, I'm worried because we know that even when there are laws, the laws in the books are not the same as the laws on the street. I have attended many global conferences that have not led to concrete global and local actions. What is right to do is not always easy to do. I'm worried because we live in a world of competing priorities. When do you think these quotes were said? This could have been expressed today, but surprisingly, those were given more than a decade ago in the first global ministerial conference in Moscow. And it seems that we are still repeating the same facts today. Reading those previous speeches made me realize that there have been progress made in the last decade of action. Nevertheless, a question that popped up in my mind was, why didn't we see this progress reflected in the reduction of road traffic death? Are we missing something? Are we going to do exactly the same things and expect different results? Since 2009, we, the youth, have asked for your help in the most polite and diplomatic way possible. 
but our peers keep dying on the roads. As Omnia said in her opening speech, we are tired of false commitments. We have received promises from governments and other institutions that road traffic injuries were going to be half by 2020. And here we are, extending the deadline to 2030. The youth are saying, enough is enough. We want to be the last generation facing this global mobility crisis. It's time to wake up. Strong political will and moral responsibility are crucial. And to be honest, at this point, many of us are tired and lost all belief in our decision makers to lead the change. You may not have been part of the decisions made in the past, but certainly you have the power to act today and tomorrow. And we, the youth, will also play our part as active citizens in society. We want to be part in the solution as equal partners, not consulted, not informed, but also participate meaningfully in the decision-making process. This will help you shape better policies and service that consider our needs. Therefore, we have launched a global youth coalition for road safety. The coalition is a group of committed young leaders and youth-led uh, NGOs from diverse backgrounds. We are ready to raise awareness, to advocate, and to be the change agents of our communities towards a safer and healthier future. The Youth Coalition is demonstrating that by connecting with other pressing issues, we can come up with holistic projects and sustainable solutions to ensure an integrated mobility system that is fair, inclusive, and accessible. For example, a young leader is working together with the authorities and youth in Comayagua, Honduras, designing the urban planning and to ensure slow speeds and multimodal means of transportation, based on a holistic vision that includes health, environmental, and accessibility components. Having said that, we ask you to embrace and unleash the full potential of a grassroots youth movement, investing in us, is investing in the future. The next decade must be about regaining the trust in our ability to change the system. So I ask, Minister, pick a lane. Will this trip be, will this trip be just a nice memory of Sweden, stop at the, uh, the Stockholm Declaration, or continue business as usual? Or will you act faster, find the finals, and unlock radical solutions? City majors and, ur and urban planners, pick a lane. Either you keep designing polluted and congested cities, or you start focusing on an integrated mobility system that allows us to safely walk, cycle, and breathe clean air. For vehicle manufacturers, pick a lane. Will some of you keep manufacturing willingly and knowingly unsafe vehicles to reach your profit? Or will you commit to a moral standard that all life deserve the highest possible safety, no matter what they live? For road builders, pick a lane. Either you keep building roads that are killing our dreams, or you start protecting vulnerable users by not building and funding less than three-star roads. For civil society at large, pick a lane. Either we remain quiet and accept the risk that we face on the road every day, or we start mobilizing communities and uniting our voices. Why are we not marching the streets against this road crash epidemic? So I ask, how much is a life worth to all of you? Either we keep preaching, or we start reaching concrete results on the ground. We, the Global Youth Coalition, have picked a lane. We are claiming our space. World leaders, we will be watching which lane you pick. Thank you. Raquel Barrios, thank you very much. So two very urgent calls to action there from Lotta and Raquel. Let's hear now from some of those who are in a position to act on those appeals, those who have the power to make change happen. We move on first to government and hear from Hala Abu Ali. She is a member of the Egyptian parliament. 
Welcome. Excellencies, ladies, gentlemen, and young people in the room. It's very difficult to speak up after a young person where we had lots of energy and uh, uh, lots of uh, uh, dreams, and uh, we hope we will be up to the standards. However, uh, I will try to uh, do my best to uh, tailor a way forward that can uh, reach uh, your dreams. From the last two days of discussion, it is clear that we can no longer continue to accept the toll that road traffic deaths and injuries take on our societies. And if we are going to affect change, we must alter our course of action. Etienne Krug said in his opening remarks that we are at a crossroads and challenged us to think what our children and grandchildren will think about the choices that we, made, we make today. After all that has been said during this conference, I am convinced that proceeding as we were will not bring our, about the necessary change. We must take a different path and we must commit ourselves, each and every one of us, to change. There are certain things that I believe we can start to address right now. What we are facing cannot be fixed superficially. What we are experiencing is the result of failing systems, decades in the making, in dire need of reform. I am a lawmaker, not a scientist, but it is clear, even for me, that we have underestimated the magnitude of the other, of the work that is required to bring about the desired changes in the time that we seek to do it in. And that's why, as has been pointed out, we need an extension of another 10 years. And I know that implementing systems level changes is not an easy thing to do, we need to bridge the gap between evidence-based scientific research and active reform so as to create sustainable, sustainable well-thought-out, effective solutions. The decade of action, the SDGs, the global performance targets have created a solid framework for the way forward. But these things alone will not solve the problems that countries are facing. Countries themselves must commit to taking action. And this means that they need to commit to national targets, national goals, and develop their own national plans. Achieving global goals is not possible without national level action. And and this must be focused of the focus of the coming years. Of course, international collaboration will be an important part of the way forward, but this collaboration must be a meaningful co collaboration, a more meaningful collaboration than we are, the one we are seeing today. And it must be driven only by country needs and demands. There is no one size fits all. Real change must come from the ground, and the financial and, tec and technical assistance of donors and international organization must support this approach. Otherwise, they will not be sustainable. That is why national targets and national plans are critical and I take this opportunity to call upon country representatives, ministers, to commit to this. To this. While political will is important, as we have heard during the past two days, as a legislator, I understand that challenges of dealing with competing demands, every topic is important, and every group wants their topic to be prioritized. So my plea to this community is simple, since we have seen that there are many NGOs and many youth that 
policymakers and lawmakers need integrated solutions. We want to kill, uh, to, to kill more than one bird with one stone. And the more that you can provide us with solutions that address not only road safety, but climate change, while at the same time reducing inequities, the easier it will be for us to respond. For road safety, these types of synergies are not only possible, they are absolutely necessary. We must, we must stop addressing road safety in a silo. And I am encouraging that the World Health Organization is co-sponsoring a conference of largely transport ministers, but this is only a start. Moving forward, we must partner with the child health movement, the climate change movement, and human rights movement. In addition, we must enhance youth engagement as they are key agents for change. We need to do it with the young for the young. Those partnerships are what it will take to bring about the scale of change that is needed. We should not and cannot do it alone. You have seen the numbers, you have heard the challenges, and my reflection is that the problem is far bigger than what we in this room can do. But I have no doubt that we can solve the problem, but we must do it with others. My hope is that at the next ministerial conference, there will be ministers of health, ministers of education, ministers of welfare, and ministers of culture. Because road safety is not merely an issue of transport. It is an issue that impacts all aspects of our lives. That is my challenge and hope. As an African, as an Egyptian, as a woman, as a human being, my hope is for a future of mobility that is safe, that is equitable, and that is, and that is built on the values of each and every member of our, our society, men, women, youth, and child. Thank you very much. Is the private sector ready to meet the challenge? How does it see its responsibility? We hear that now from one of this country's main business leaders. Please welcome the president and CEO of the Volvo Group. Great to see you. So, uh, excellencies, uh, dear ministers, uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, Great honor to be here. Uh, my name is Martin. Uh, I'm the president and CEO of the Volvo Group, uh, a truly global company. Uh, we are from Swedish heritage, so it's a pleasure to welcome you also to Sweden. Uh, but in that respect, we are present today uh, with uh, current business in more than 190 countries around the globe, uh, providing them uh, solutions for uh, mainly commercial vehicles uh, such as uh, trucks, buses, uh, and construction equipment uh, around the globe now. Um, I'm traveling a lot, obviously, uh, since we are in 190 countries, and I'm very proud and humbly proud to say that uh, when I meet uh, different stakeholders, customers, employees, but also, of course, uh, civil society and, and decision makers, uh, we talk a little bit about Volvo and a little bit later, uh, I ask them, if you, if you close your eyes and think about one word uh, and, and Volvo together, uh, often actually safety is coming up, and that is very, very uh, humbling for us, obviously, and we have a big responsibility. So it's a true privilege to be here and, and to represent the, uh, the private sector. We at Volvo, we also have a long tradition uh, of engagement in global efforts of this kind because we believe that it's super important that we work together. Already in 1972, Volvo Group was actually the only private sector stakeholder present at the first United Nations Conference on Environment, 
which also took place uh, by coincidence here in Stockholm. At that time, my predecessor, Dr. Yulenhammar, said something that was quite unexpected, but still holds true, both for the sustainable development uh, and for uh, safety, obviously, that is part of that. He said, we are part of the problem, so by that we also need to be part of the solution, and we have the means to be part of the solution. And what is exciting is that not only that we have to do something, as Sir Rockel said here, more importantly, we are entering into an unprecedented era when it comes to logistics. So many things will happen, I will outline why that will happen. Our societies depend on transport. I think that is important to remember. Every single one of us do that in order to get goods, to, to remove waste, to recycle, but also to, to bring equality, for example, when it comes to public transportation, when it comes to mobility. We believe that transport truly is one of the bloodlines. It's part of driving prosperity for, for every society. And there is a very clear link, as a matter of fact, between GDP development as being one metric of wealth and prosperity and the efficiency in the transportation and the logistical system. At the same time, we are facing, as I said, unprecedented global challenges, but also opportunities. Urbanization, population and economic growth that create an increased demand, not decreased, but increased demand of transport, both of goods and people, which in turn put stress on the transport system, on health and safety and on the climate. We need to meet these challenges, not by decreasing transport, by doing them considerably, not a little bit, but considerably more sustainable and safe. And I would tell you, uh, talking about the previous panel here, even if a lot of things have happened since, for example, 1972, if you take a photo of the equipment we used at that time. To me, also as a business leader, the most important thing in life and I think it goes for all of us, is family and friends. As the CEO of a large company with more than 100,000 colleagues, and then if you expand that to, to related families and obviously business partners, I personally, but together also with colleagues in senior management, have the responsibility for health and safety of our employees. This is always my biggest concern, and my first priority. That is the first question I put out if I'm in a service workshop, in a production plant, traveling. How do we do when it comes to the safety work? All colleagues should come home safely. As a vehicle manufacturer and a provider of transport solutions, we also, of course, play a crucial role in providing our customers with the tools they need to keep their drivers and their operators safe and bring them home to their families and friends. But also, of course, to ensure that they are not involved in incidents affecting other uh, uh, members of the traffic system or other uh, people that are interlinked with the transportation system. In other words, the private sector but all organizations really that uh, uh, the previous speakers have mentioned can create a big impact by addressing road safety, not only as a transport issue, but also as an occupational health issue and also what values you want to stand for as a company. And it must start with a genuine humanistic view, people for people. So how do we go then from words to action? I believe that the private sector, especially multinational companies, is in a unique position to create impact by bringing its global best practice and standard to local initiatives. Change starts from within, and what is truly needed is a stronger safety mindset among leaders and organizations everywhere. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Davos for the World Economic Forum, where I shared the automotive governors meeting. We discussed the road safety challenge at length, uh, and the urgency of the issue is one of the main priority. And the governor's meeting is not a discussion club. It is a list of tasks where we follow up, and we again invite everyone, 
including uh, Reiki Lamin, that we can interact on, on these initiatives together. And there is a very concrete list, actually. The true strength, thank you, the true strength of the private sector is the drive to innovate in order to outperform the competition. To outperform the competition. It is the power we must tap into to mobilize fully the enormous potential of the private sector. And we have to stop pilot. We need to deploy more broader. We have a lot of good solutions. And when I say pilot, it's not specific pilots, it's also country pilots that we heard, for example, about the Nordic countries here. We must deploy it much broader. Still, there are too many old equipments, not updated, not upgraded, that are used in the transport system. We must ensure the sustainable development of solutions make business sense so that technology companies can continue to invest heavily resources into critical developments and so that public and private organizations can invest in the solutions they develop. But to do that, we need to have the right mechanism. And do we have that? Take a step back. Do we give the good guys enough advantage? And do we deter the poor performers? Do we do that? The next decade will be all about acceleration, the sustainable transformation of different kinds. And it's a must to do that in transportation if we should be even close to reach what we have said in the Paris Agreement together. Transportation is a key sector. Volvo identified the critical role of safety already in, at inception 1927. At that time, perhaps mainly as a moral duty, a true belief not the business case. But we know now that the improved road safety increases transport system efficiency, reduces the burden of crashes and injuries on families. And that's the reason why we have brought, not only us, but also the industry, so many innovations. In the 60s, the safety belt was not the business case. It was the belief that you need to have a human-centric view on innovation. And I'm happy that my predecessors in that company took that brave decision. Of the $2 billion we are investing every year in research and development, the absolute majority go to sustainability and safety measures. To drive change, electrification, autonomous, connectivity. One million connected units we have on the roads today. We can drive that now. Safety zones, as we've heard about. Curitiba BRT system, 50% reduction thanks to, of, of injuries and accidents, thanks to safety zones. Deploy technology that exists, working together, see it as a system. The way to self-driving, L4, L5. I mean, we will deploy so many technologies that can be used already today. Emergency braking, lane department warning, uh, drive alert, what have you, drowsiness. You know everything about this, and we do it. And electromobility, of course. Why I'm saying that? Because we need to take a system view of mobility with electromobility. Let's use that to integrate safety as we speak. At the same time, of course, we need to work hard to mobilize all sectors in low- and middle-income countries. Uh, I think that is super important. We need to take joint responsibility here. We are doing a lot here, not at least when it comes to vocational training from the private sector. I'm pleased to say that together with the Indian authorities and government, we have, for example, uh, educated and trained more than 100,000 drivers when it comes to, to safety. A small initiative that we are deploying all around the globe is, is actually stop, look, wave for all young people. In order to do that, all our employees are going out once uh, or two, twice per year to, to train all over the world. So it's legal instruments, it's funding, it's education, it is technology. So, now, my pledge. As a representative of the private sector, I will do it for the Volvo Group. We are not only getting used to the environmental footprint, we know it's a business imperative, we know it's a competitive advantage. We need to be also even more clear when it comes to road safety. So it's clear to me that each of us need also to consider our own, we are a big transport provider and transport buyer ourselves, our own safety footprint. And I'm committing now to ensure Volvo takes charge here and to start to disclose that as we speak. What is our own safety footprint? My goal is to have the most sustainable transport system in all different aspects when it comes to our internal system by 
2030, but I'm aiming for 2025. No one knows who have it today, by the way. I'm trying to, to find it somewhere, but it doesn't exist. But someone has to start to disclose a baseline. I will do that. As a society, our biggest obstacle is perhaps then uh, our courage to find and commit to these necessary solutions, but we will do that together. So, uh, I will end there. I had a number more things to say. Uh, I like this uh, conference, this, the, the, the spread, the breadth, uh, and, and the depth of the discussions, the openness and transparency. President Truman said once, um, it's amazing what you can achieve if you don't care who gets the credits. And I think we should work in that spirit. With with the Stockholm Declaration, a new target of halving fatalities by 2030. We need to do it now, we'll not promise another time, but do it. And um, together, again, we can accelerate progress. And the private sector and Volvo, we are really committed. And I would like to, to actually stop my speech and end my speech with a with quote of uh, uh, Gunnar Engelau, uh, the, the president of the Volvo Group during the introduction of the safety belt in the 60s. He said, which I like, uh, he said, I take off my hat for everything that actually has been achieved. But I take off my jacket and I roll up the sleeves for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin Lundstedt. Ladies and gentlemen, we meet here to mark the end of the UN Decade of Action on Road Safety. But from everything we have heard here in the panels, from the Stockholm Declaration, from the recommendations of the expert groups, it is clear that international collaboration at the highest level will only be more important going forward. It's an honor to welcome back to the stage the United Nations Secretary General Special Envoy for Road Safety, Jean Todt. Please, the floor is yours. Ministers, Excellencies, ladies, gentlemen, friends. We have reached the end of our conference and I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to everyone here. Tremendous thanks to the Swedish government, Minister Thomas Enroth. <clears throat> and WHO for this commendable undertaking. <clears throat> Over the past few days, we have all made journeys real journeys, and journeys of the imagination. Representatives of more than 140 countries have traveled to Sweden in the name of strengthening road safety. And to take stock of work done in the past decade, through some rich, innovative, and powerful exchanges, we have journeyed to the future to plan our roadmap for the coming years. Young people voices and civil society have been central to this. This is important because it's our young people who will live with the consequences of our decisions and actions. Everyone gathered here is aware that the death and injury toll from road crashes has not fallen in 20 years. Throughout this conference, this unforgivable fact has forced us to look at ourselves and ask, in all honesty, do we currently value safety as a foundation of our road transport systems? We say we care about road safety, but there is a big shortfall between what we say and what we do. To reduce road deaths and injuries, and not just fatalistically tolerate them, we need a transformation in thinking. We need to evolve into a new area which is fundamentally and holistically grounded in safety. This means laying down safety as a value so non-negotiable that as the aviation industry, it actually becomes part of the DNA of the road transport system. 
when we evaluate the effectiveness of the system, safety should be an inherent measure of success and value. If we can reshuffle the values that currently overpower our road transport systems, short-term cost benefits, speed, personal choice, and so on, for one that prioritizes safety, then we have a real chance to make a change. When safety as a value becomes the guiding star for our road transport systems, with help of the UN conventions, they will evolve regardless of location or a country's income level. Some consumers, those who can afford to, are willing to pay more for safety, which means that we accept it as a commodity. In doing this, we send the message that it is acceptable for some people to be safe on the road, but not all. What will we do to change that? Coming from the world of motorsports, safety was core to all what we did. There was a system in place, and it was the system that assured the safety of the sport. I was shocked to see what this was not the case for road transport, and our society was so indifferent to road crash deaths. When I took on the role of the United Nations Secretary General Special for Road Safety, I thought it was something we could easily change. I thought it was a matter of getting people to do what we knew worked. I finally understand that, unlike in the motorsports or the airline industry, safety is not necessarily the guiding star. It is just one of several factors that can be demoted in favor of other factors at any turn. That is where we are going wrong. So this means the journey, the journey for, for us is just starting. Countries are not all at the same starting point and are dealing with different challenges. Our aim is to ensure that transport systems, no matter how they are configured, are safe, sustainable, and equitable. To do this, there is one thing we can and must ensure as we travel home, that we will all commit to making safety the underpinning value of how we act in the interest of road safety for all. We must ensure that safety is a driving force behind the evolution of mobility and transport. This message, this message needs to be also heard by the car manufacturers and suppliers who were underrepresented at this conference this week. No more unworthy products. We can no longer accept them. <laughs> Same for road investments. Killer roads are a waste of resources. The money should be there. We have heard how the investment banks intend to make their contribution. States can do the same by supporting the United Nations Road Safety Fund and also how they arrange their own budgets at home. The will to act is there. We have heard from the ministers. We garnered great interest, mobilized actors, and collected needed tools. Today, we can add the final ingredient. A commitment to make safety the core value of all we do as citizens ministers, road safety experts, producers, and consumers when it comes to our mobility system. And if we don't do it, let's fast forward 10 years. We are in 2030. Our headline statistics is that despite ongoing road safety interventions, road traffic deaths and injuries are still running at around 1.4 million per year. Nothing has changed except that another 14 million people are now dead and 500 million people more have sustained injuries. Some of these people are yet to be born. This future will mean we are short of yet another SDG target, betraying the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, with far too many being left behind. But this is not inevitable. What if our conference here helps us avoid this scenario? What better honor to give all those who have died on our roads in the past decades than to do things differently?
to make safety first. Is such a shift possible? The straight answer is yes. It has been done in other sectors. We owe it to the next generation to leave them with mobility that is not mired in death and injuries. My dear friends, we must act on our belief that sustainable transport is possible. To the youth here today, my message is simple. We have heard you. And we commit to supporting your vision for safe and sustainable mobility. We will start by committing to valuing safety by embedding it so firmly in our road transport system that deaths and injuries are the thing of the past. Let us, pass us this chance, let us not pass us this chance to do things differently. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to Jean Todt. When it comes to commitment, ladies and gentlemen, I think all of us can agree that we have seen unparalleled dedication here from the sponsors and hosts of this conference. They will now also say a few closing words to us. I would like to begin by asking the WHO's Etienne Krug to please return to the stage. Dear friends, and I don't use this word lightly, I really feel we are all friends and I have felt so much friendship during these last two days. Wow. I can't believe we are arriving at the end of this conference. Sometimes, because I go to many conferences, and sometimes I go to a conference and a two-day conference feels like a week. This week's conference feels like much less than two days went back uh, by like that. And as I prepared for these last farewell words, I was wondering what will I remember from this conference? And the first thing that came to mind was the very moving tribute before we started the conference, the pile of shoes. And I've brought two of the shoes here in this room where they belong. Rochelle spoke so well at that event, and I cannot even start trying to speak like her, but I remember she said, these are the shoes of broken dreams. These are shoes that used to walk, to run, to skip, to dance, and they don't anymore. They're a sacred monument to what was and will never be again. I would like to ask you all to stand up for a short minute of silence to remember all of those who died on the road. Thank you very much. I'm putting the shoes there so we can see them and remember them. This should be one of the last minutes of silence we have to do, because in this conference we committed to action. We committed to 50 by 30, and hopefully it's the beginning of a vision zero, and no more minutes of silence will be needed for road traffic victims, because we won't have victims anymore. So thank you for having stood up. I also walk away energized, knowing that we are not alone. We have the beginning of a youth movement with us. The youth assembly was absolutely fantastic. For those who had, did not have a chance to be there, believe me, I think through Raquel's speech, to Omnia's speech, and to the presence of all the young people in the room, you've felt it. Flor, Manpreet, Raquel, Thiago, Omnia, thank you so much. Now please go home and snowball. This needs to be the beginning of a much bigger movement of young people for road safety. I was thinking just a few minutes ago, my kids don't go to school on Fridays because they protest for the environment. 
What if one day the kids don't go to school on Monday because they're scared to go to school because they're at risk? It's not my idea, think about it. And then there was another event that we talked about briefly and clapped for just before the conference started, but I think it deserves to be mentioned as we leave. It's the Bloomberg Philanthropy's commitment of $240 million. This is three times more than the biggest ever commitment, which was already the biggest at the time. So thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you to all Bloomberg Philanthropies. I mean, with the young people, with this injection of resources, with the strong NGO alliance, we are well poised. I will also remember that King Carl Gustav joined us for the opening. This is so important. As we say in the declaration, we want a meeting of heads of state, and it was just that the head of state of the host country was here, and I hope all heads of state will be mobilized in the coming years for road safety. I will remember that this was the largest conference ever on international road safety, and the largest number of ministers attended, showing, again, the political commitment that is growing for our field. I will, of course, remember the fantastic speeches throughout the two days and the events before. I think they've evolved. We are now talking about our topic more in depth and we are managing to put it much more in context of other issues, other SDGs, the environment aspect, the physical activity aspects. We had side events on so many things which has definitely grown. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Thank you to all the speakers. Thank you to all those who contributed to the content of this conference, which was solid. I will remember, of course, the very strong declaration. We have a good document there, a good basis to continue our work. Let's use it. I will definitely remember the perfect organization and the very warm hospitality of our Swedish hosts. Thank you very much through you, Thomas, but also the whole team. It was fantastic to work with you. It was a real pleasure. I won't miss the intensity, but I certainly will miss the, the interaction we had. It was always positive, always constructive, always enthusiastic. Thank you so much for that. Let me also thank my WHO colleagues here in the room and those who didn't come but worked from Geneva for many, many months and very, very hard. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you very much. And finally, I have to say, it was hard work to prepare this conference, but this is just the beginning. We have a long road ahead. First step, UN General Assembly. The declaration needs to become a UN General Assembly resolution in order to have more weight and to make sure that we will have a heads of state summit very soon. Therefore, a short plea to all the ministers and heads of delegations in this room. Could you please send a message as soon as possible to your ambassador in New York saying this declaration is coming, please support the transformation of the declaration into a UN General Assembly resolution. And finally, and most importantly, declarations, UN General Assembly resolutions are important, but of course, we want to see that decrease at national, at city level, at local level. We look very much forward to work with you, please, it was no word coming to Stockholm if you don't go home and start implementing more programs and differently as we have said. So thank you very much. Have a safe trip home. Etienne Krug, thank you very much for those inspiring words. Ladies and gentlemen, the Director General of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, has also sent us a farewell message. Let's hear his words. I'm so pleased to receive the outcomes of your deliberations in the form of this global youth statement on road safety. Enough is enough, as you rightly say. Governments and their partners must work together to build on progress and accelerate road safety reforms for the youth of the world. As noted in the statement, young people can play an instrumental role in terms of scaling up interventions that are already delivering results in other countries and in being role models for road safety best practice. 
a paradigm shift is indeed needed to make young people part of the road safety solution rather than blaming them for their deaths on the road. In this regard, we need to rethink mobility to better protect young people and all who use the world's roads to enable people to walk and cycle in safety and reap the benefits to health and the environment and to ensure safe routes to school. I'm so pleased to have the opportunity to convey your messages to ministers and other policy makers during the ministerial conference. It's important that we connect across generations so that we can meaningfully engage with one another. As Stockholm Declaration guides us over the next decade, I count on you to mobilize your peers and communities to continue collaborating with all relevant stakeholders to save lives. Keep knocking on doors for change. The Ministerial Conference offers many opportunities to learn about a range of topics, from achieving SDG targets through Vision Zero to mitigating climate change through road safety, improving safety for pedestrians and cyclists and enhancing emergency trauma care and so much more. Take advantage of this wonderful opportunity so that yours is the last generation to face this global road safety crisis. Taxomike, I thank you. So as, as I have just been informed, that was actually not quite the message uh, we were supposed to hear. That was the message that went to the Youth Assembly. But that is, I'm sure, uh, quite a compliment for all of those who don't feel quite so young. And after all, after the third global ministerial is before the fourth global ministerial. So we'll just take that message with us on the road, Etienne Krug. And uh, thank you very much, nonetheless, to Dr. Ghebreyesus uh, for speaking to us. So before I hand over now to our host to close the third global ministerial, let me just very briefly say thank you so much to our interpreters sitting up there in those undoubtedly very hot little boxes. Thank you. To all the technicians and organizing team who work so hard behind the scenes. To the Sherpas who helped me make this journey, Nan and Anders, thank you so much to both of you. Of course, also to the hosts and sponsors, and most especially, ladies and gentlemen, to you for your attention. These were very intensive days. You have been so unfailingly prompt and friendly. Thank you so much. And I look forward to all of us perhaps having our paths cross again and certainly taking the message home with us when we go. I wish you safe journeys. Goodbye. And it's a great honor to hand over to our host, the minister from Sweden, Thomas Eneroth, to close this conference. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Melinda. I was a little bit nervous there. <laughs> well, Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, fellow ministers from across over the world, Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, friends and road safety colleagues and friends. And first of all, what a conference. What a conference we have accomplished. Over 1,700 delegates. We have joined this important gathering. And I'm so grateful for your participation. All the inspiration from the speakers, discussions in the corridors and the first meetings. And of course, giving all new perspectives. This is our first step to form new partnerships and new ways of tackling our common challenges. And together, we start to implement the words in the Stockholm Declaration into real action. And as I said in the opening session, on every highway, on every street, for every community, and for every child, by being here, you have shown that road safety is a shared responsibility. 
We have taken all relevant perspectives into account and created what I call a very broad ownership. And I want the message to, from the plenary, from the parallel sessions, and from the discussions in the corridor to be clear. And that has certainly been the case. I am more convinced than ever, we can do it. So, before I summarize my thoughts, we are thankful for the engagement, for the support and involvement from World Health Organization. Thank you, Etienne, for the magnificent work. Thanks also to the Swedish Transport Administration for helping to arrange this conference and the city of Stockholm for hosting us here. And I'm proud of the tireless effort put in by the Ministry for Infrastructure for making this conference. And I want to thank all the event staff, the volunteers who have assisted on site. Without you, there, would have been a con there wouldn't have been a conference. And I also want to thank the interpreters, like Melinda did, for their invaluable work. Thank you very much. We have been looking for an inclusive process, and I want to express my sincere gratitude to the academic expert group, the international ad advisor group, the steering committee, and our high-level consultative committee. And I will also take this opportunity to express my appreciation to all involved in elaborating the Stockholm Declaration, input from all the stakeholders throughout this process, and during these two days serve both as an inspiration but also as an injecting a sense of urgency for our joint work which lies ahead. So to all non-governmental organizations, private sector and civil society, thank you for manifesting that road safety is a topic we engage all parts of society. And my sincere gratitude to all of you making this conference a success. So it is now our, both mine and yours, responsibility to make our common ambitions a vision into reality. We have to keep in mind, a lot has been done. Great achievement has been made during the UN Decade of Action for Road Safety, and we are moving into the right direction, but we still have a long way to go. Road traffic fatalities still stand at too high number. And I started yesterday talking about the need for a new perspective on road safety with the 2030 Agenda in focus. But also a need for a new starting point for better international knowledge sharing and cooperation. And of course, the importance of intensifying our joint work in order to deliver a 50% reduction in road traffic fatalities over the next decade. That is what the Stockholm Declaration is about. Now, we need to implement it. And we implement the Declaration by pointing out the important role of road safety for making progress on the global sustainable challenges. We implement the Declaration by speeding up the shift towards safer, cleaner, more energy efficient and affordable modes. And we highlight the importance of speed management and developing and applying innovative technologies and solutions in all parts of traffic and road safety. And we implement the declaration by pointing out the need for investment in infrastructure and the scaling up of activities related to road safety. So in the Stockholm Declaration, it will form an important basis for the work on the annual General Assembly Resolution on Road Safety. And I look forward to these discussions that I trust will clearly point out the direction for the UN, its member states and other stakeholders in our joint work to achieve the goal of reducing the number of road traffic fatalities as a part of the 2030 Agenda. So, over the past two days, I've heard a lot of interesting presentations sharing experience and visions from around the world. And from many bilateral meetings, I feel assured that many countries and governments now share my vision and ambition. And only by working together, we can ensure that one 
No one is left behind during this process. So words on paper, as we heard from a lot of speakers today, words on papers are of course important. But it is how we act and what we do that really matters. I will take action. Now it's time for decision making. I will raise the Stockholm Declaration in multilateral arenas and in every bilateral conversation I have. And I will make sure that the voices from the youth and the civil society will be heard. And I offer my commitment and Sweden's commitment. But to be honest, I need all of your commitment. So let's make that commitment together and let that be the statement of the Stockholm Declaration. Thank you for coming here to Sweden. See you on the barricades. Thank you.